Hello everyone. I apologize. My name is Lisa Richardson for folks who are still coming in. I am apologize for a little bit of our delay here that we've had today. Hi there. Yes, I think we've done it now finally. Thanks so much everyone this morning. My name is Lisa Richardson. Um, I'm getting used to this Facebook Live platform today and had a few technical problems. Um, um, but we made it here into the um, into our uh, our Facebook Live on this on this Friday here today. I appreciate that you're here with me. Um, I know folks will kind of slowly come on, and hopefully we'll be able to um, ask lots of questions as we um, talk about today. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a pediatric dietitian, and I've been one for 26 years. I kind of have about three part-time jobs right now. Um, 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 looking forward to telling you a little bit about my journey as being a pediatric dietitian and talk about some really timely issues that are going on right now in, um, um, in, in the pediatric nutrition world. Um, and in fact, let's start, oh, all right. Oh, thank you, I'm seeing everybody's comments. I appreciate that, um, welcome. And if you're online, jump in, say hello. I wanna hear, especially if I have any other pediatric dietitians who might be out there today. Post all of your questions in the comments. I'd love to hear from you as we go along so that this can be a lot of fun for everyone. So uh, just a few things. I mentioned I'm Lisa Richardson. Um, you can find me online in social media, not so much lately because as what I'm about ready to talk about, it's taken up a lot of my time. But I'm actually the owner of, a, of an unusual website called Formula Sense. It's a place that healthcare providers can get unbiased information about infant formulas, help them in their clinical care. And I'm also developing some retail, um, some, some tools for parents right now too. Um, so I, um, 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 that's one of my passion projects and um, that's developed over many years of being a dietitian and I hope to tell you about that. I also can be found online on my newest um, project, another passion project it's working on, which is the Knowing Nutrition website. So you can find me at the knowingnutritionhub.com. Um, um, that's actually a place that I'm developing because um, I can really see that there's a lot of people interested in pediatrics. They want to be pediatric providers. They want to do that as a career, and it's really hard to get training. So I'm working on that. And in fact, Andrew, I see you just mentioned that to us, right? You got zero training in, in pediatrics in school. Um, and I hear that from lots of folks. It's kind of hard to get into the subspecialty. So I want to talk about that a little bit too today. So those are the places you can find me. I'm the best. I am a little bit on um, on Instagram these days at, at Formula Sense. Not as much though as recently. Um, so let's let's talk about what's kind of keeping me off social media and keeping my time time busy. And if you are a uh, if you happen to be a an adult dietitian, um, you might not know about this as much or seen it just a little on the news. But we've really recently, um, in mid-February, had an unprecedented formula recall that happened. Um, now, now, we have to back up probably about six months before that. And that, that is prior to this formula recall. We were already experiencing shortages of many of the therapeutic formulas that we use for infants and for older kids. And I should mention, too, when we're talking about formula in this context, um, you know, formula, we think of babies, but actually in the pediatric world, we use formulas across the lifespan for kids for lots of different reasons. Many of them are how we're thinking about how we're feeding through G-tubes and also through enteral nutrition. But we were experiencing this actually almost for months, um, having to running out of things in hospitals, having a hard time getting them in an outpatient, having to switch around some of our special formulas. So then we go back to um, to middle of February, and then there's a voluntary national recall that's happened. Um, and it happened from one plant in Michigan that belongs to the Abbott Company. Now the important thing about this particular recall and kind of how it, in the ripples it's had throughout um, uh, the pediatric nutrition world is that this was the single plant that from Abbott where they make an important elemental formula called Elecare. They also at this plant made Alimentum, their signature um, um, hydrolyzed formula. These are ones that we use especially for, for babies who have food allergies or really bad GI problems. You use them with kids who have short gut. Lots of reasons we might use these things. So what I've heard from some of my contacts 
that might be interesting that folks might not know is that that this formula element the elemental formula is actually what I heard haven't verified this anywhere but it fits with my experience is that these formulas LA care were about 60% of the elemental formula market and it was gone like that there was literally next to none that was available so there's obviously other formulas out there, but as those things came flying off the stock, off the shelf, um, in warehouses, through durable medical equipment providers, at hospitals, what happened was there wasn't enough stock of these other alternative products to take um, the place. So your pediatric colleagues for the last month have been playing what I call a little bit of game of whack-a-mole. Um, we're trying to replace with other formulas. We're trying to um, um, do our best for our, our, our patients. And it's honestly exhausting, and it's been really heartbreaking for our patients. Um, the other hard thing to think about with these specialized formulas, this plant was also the one that made metabolic formulas. These are the kids where food is the treatment of their disease. And um, they weren't necessarily recalled, but they're also not being made. So there's several formulas that are in the metabolic world that we just don't have access to right now. So I mentioned that if anybody has more questions. Um, one thing that I did want to mention about with this recall, if you didn't know about it, is it really centered around um, um, two um, uh, bacteria through um, one called Cronobacter Suzuki. Um, this is a gram-negative bacteria that thrives in very dry environments, the exact environment that you're going to find in infant formula and a dry powder. Um, contamination with this, 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 is, this, is a, this is a critter, this is a bug that's everywhere in the environment. Um, there's been recalls in Europe and the United States related to this that the first one I can find goes back to 1989, so it's really been around for a while. And um, uh, uh, so, so it's something that we know is out there, and it's something that um, formula manufacturers are always trying to protect against. Um, and unfortunately, um, we did find it, and the most recent um, reports from the FDA is showing that um, Abbott needed to do a lot better of how they were handling their quality control and keeping the production line clean. So I'm happy if anybody has any more questions about what's going on or a little bit more about formulas with that. Um, I'd really love, I'm happy to answer those and tell you a little bit about that. Um, and in fact, some of these challenges with formulas um, are one of the reasons why I, um, um, I started Formula Sense. Um, I don't know if anybody who's listening in knows how many formulas there actually are on the U.S. market right now. Um, if you got a guess, put it in the comment section for me. If you had to have a, a guess of how many infant formulas you can actually buy um, either online or um, at retail right now. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's actually 64 different formulas. As you can imagine, that's in a really difficult for parents to make some choices and make some decisions about. So, um, yeah, and so I see a question about, you know, not thinking that this issue is getting a lot of press. Why do I think that is? Um, you know, I think that's a really um, complicated, yeah, Susan, I, I appreciate saying it's tons, right? 64 is a really big number. Um, I think the press around this has really been interesting. Um, you, you know, I think the scale of it hasn't been um, well described by folks. I think a lot of us, me included, have just really had our heads down and our ears back trying to help parents every day. Um, um, I think because it hasn't, it's, it's around specialized formulas already. These are medical, so parents are turning to healthcare providers. Um, to actually be associated with this too. Um, I don't think it's going to necessarily stay quiet for long because it's going to continue on um, as we're continuing on with this um, um, and see, uh, you know, we don't know exactly when this ends. Um, um, you know, even just yesterday I have, I've had some, some kiddos that I'm on their third formula um, that we're trying to, um, to work with. Um, with them on that just because of access and accessibility. We don't expect that some of the shortages we are experiencing beforehand necessarily are going to go away and that this is going to maybe be with us for a little while still too. So, ah, Susan, I saw you were a DTR and worked in the formula room. So, yeah, you certainly know all of the challenges that go along with it. And, you know, much kudos about formula rooms, really. 
Um, I think they're kind of really underappreciated in a hospital. Um, you know, these formula rooms go to great because we're feeding babies and children who are sick. Remember, formula is not just for babies. I, I, I had a 15-year-old yesterday I was working with. I had a, I had a 10-year-old, too, right, who were on some of these specialized formulas. Um, you know, that's the place where we really want to make sure we have really good care. Um, and washing hands, good clean surfaces. So um, I think that's a really important part. Um, let's see. Oh, I see a question. Um, is Neocade easily accessible in the United States? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And certainly Neocade is one of the um, replacement. Neocate has several elemental formulas. And it used to be pretty accessible within the United States. That's a great example of a formula that we moved in to replace the Elecare. It was actually one of our first go-to. We actually use it a fair amount. It's got some different features than what El that, that Elecare has. But as that stock went away, um, and then we also have heard, we, we know some families were um, hoarding formula as soon as they heard of this formula, recall, um, and the stock depleted. Um, the interesting thing about Neocate is it's not manufactured in the United States. It's manufactured um, in Europe. It's made in the Netherlands. Um, it's usually sent over on a ship. Um, and my understanding, having talked to some various folks, including some folks at Gerber who do other extensively hydrolyzed formulas is that, who, make, who are made in Europe, is that they'd worked very closely with FDA to fill this gap, sending things by airplane at very high cost. So, so we do have a Neocate available, um, but its access um, is spotty. Talking to doc dietitians across the country, um, I've had the experience that Neocate was in stock in one of the companies that my patient would get their formula through, through their insurance. Um, and it was there in the morning, and by the afternoon it was gone and they couldn't ship it. So we had to make yet another choice. Um, so, and I also see this great question, um, and I've heard this too, about why aren't these moms just being taught how to relactate? Wow. <laughs> so feeding, infant feeding is never a simple or straightforward solution, um, a situation. And I think the best way to think about this is, is a few issues. Certainly, I know of one mom who had initially just said, I'm going to go back and try to relactate. But I think the key thing to this is we're not talking just about babies here. Um, sometimes I mention this, I've, I've got kids up to 15, 16 years old who are on these very specialized um, formulas. Um, it's been a very long time since their mothers um, gave birth. Um, so, so that's an important part of it. And two, to keep in mind that these are often children who have very, how do best to describe it? It's more than just food allergies. These are children who have um, many GI problems where they can't have intact proteins. We absolutely, as healthcare providers, support breastfeeding. We do to make sure every feeding counts, helping moms who have to supplement and combine with these highly specialized formulas. But it's not a really a simple thing when we're going back to these, when we have um, alterations in their metabolism, in their GI tract. This is their treatment. This is medicine to them. Um, and, and I know that's kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around if you haven't spent a lot of ch time with children um, with these kind of challenges. Um, um, but it's very much um, the reality for many of them. Um, um, so I, I think that's... I think that's why that's not the right solution. And I can tell you, being a pediatric, I've been a pediatric dietitian for 26 years. I've worked in public health. I actually left nutrition for a little while, y'all. I'm happy to talk about that, too, because I think that perspective, leaving dietetics, seeing a different worldview. I worked in the world of child traumatic stress as an evaluator. I came back to nutrition with a really refreshed view of some of these things that I see about how families make decisions. Um, I guess I also want to talk about formula use too um, and say that another issue I don't think is getting widespread understanding is that there's becoming really good research out there, global research, not just coming out of the United States. Australia has a lot of this, Ireland has a lot of this research, we see some coming out of Europe. Is that families who need to turn to formula, and I'll tell you they say that they feel they really need to be able to do this feel judged, 
They feel unsupported by healthcare providers. Um, they feel less than as parents. Um, so kind of going back to that question about relactating, I want us to be really mindful in thinking about our families as whole people, as whole, um, uh, more to their life um, that's going on more medically than what's going on for them as we think about what's the right solution for them and really being able to work with them in a really collaborative environment. I, I just can't tell you how important that is to me. Um, in working with families and um, how much I hear back from that for our families because we want, we want all of our families to, to know that they have a lot of struggles that might be going on and that they can make safe and good choices for themselves. Um, so let's see, um, let's see, maybe this is a good time to talk about, I know many other folks who, um, who do these Facebook Lives really talk about their story. Um, and I know the theme from those stories is, oh, you know, there were a lot of twists and turns. Where have I ended up today, especially for those of us who've been doing this for 20 years, isn't where I thought I started out on. Um, so I'd love to tell you a little bit about that. Um, um, you know, Andrew posted earlier and said, you know, I got no training in pediatrics, right? So how do you become a pediatric dietitian, right? Where, where does it come from? So for my personal story, um, I'm one of the rare dietitians who knew I wanted to go into, not only knew I wanted to go into pediatrics um, or maternal and ch child health, they're, they're really go, go closely to together. And I was able to get in and find one of the few programs in the country at the time I was, I was in training, which was in the 90s, where you, could, um, where you could do that, where I could get a specialty in maternal and child nutrition. I did that at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and Cleveland, Ohio, um, and I just, it was a small program, it was public health oriented, but I have to say this really turned out to be this perfect program for me personally, public health oriented with a nice mix of clinical. Um, just, a, just a fabulous, fabulous professors, um, small classes, um, and this might sound amazing to you all, but I love to tell this story, is that um, I had to be forced into a rotation to do with um, um, in my, in, uh, right then it was called the DP4 programs. Um, it was a pre-professional version of the program. Um, but I did still have um, this, you know, internships and rotations. And, and towards the end of my time, as I was about ready to get my master's and be able to be qualified to sit for the RD exam, my, my advisor turned to me and she goes, oh my goodness, Lisa, I just realized you've actually never done any rotation that involved adults. Um, um, and so they, I, was, I was a little reluctant. I was like, oh, I almost got out of having to do a, a much with adults. Um, uh, you know, adults-focused nutrition. But the thing I like to remind us is that when I work with kids, I'm actually working through adults. I'm just not working with them in their medical with them. But I'm really collaborating and working with them. And that's the interesting thing about pediatrics is we're actually going through other people to help our patients. And that's really a very special skill um, to be able to have. So after that time, um, so I was really lucky, and I decided at that time I wanted to go into public health. I had a very strong um, uh, feelings around, and I still do very much, but it was, it was very much a calling early in my career. I love the clinical, I love, I love learning about nutrition, um, but I started off actually as a, as a WIC nutritionist in a small rural counties in North Carolina. Um, um, it was kind of a medium-sized county. Um, now, WIC looks different in every state, so an important thing to tell you about North Carolina WIC is that North Carolina WIC is integrated into our public health centers. So we aren't like a separate center. I was literally a health department employee. And because of that, we're often kind of sharing and working across all of our other programs. So even though I worked in part for WIC, I also was working in our high-risk OB clinic. Um, that we were running um, out of the health department. And so I really just got some fabulous um, experience. Um, I moved pretty quickly on about a year or so. There was an opening. Um, and my former boss left. She became what we call a regional nutrition consultant across the state. She really encouraged me to apply for a WIC director program. And so I, I applied to one of those. And I became a WIC director for a few years. Um, in another small, even smaller and more rural um, uh, 
County. If I have any North Carolinians on um, the call or who will watch this later, I was up in Person County in Roxboro, um, right on the Virginia line. And there, you know, I have to say what a gift it was for me to work. Um, I, had, I had studied in this urban environment, very much an urban environment, um, in inner city Cleveland um, is, is a good part of where I did my training. And then I came to North Carolina and I saw this very different environment where I was in rural communities. Um, some of my first patients, I'll tell you that I had, particularly in Person County, I had, I had one of the most memorable experiences is caring for a, a, a newly, a premature infant, newly discharged, who lived in a home that didn't have running water. Um, I, um, there were two or three of them in that, in that particular community where there were homes that didn't have running water, um, and we were really looking at how to really help care for those babies safely. Keep in mind, this is the 1990s. Um, this isn't going back to the 50s or 60s. Um, and as I understand it, some of those homes really didn't even get running water until about 10 years after I left. Um, um, so that was part of my story. Um, and I really um, loved um, the training, and I loved the WIC program. Anybody who thinks that they might want to work for WIC, especially in North Carolina, I'd love you to consider it. Because um, I felt really lucky to put my, my nutrition, my public health and nutrition and my pediatric experience right to work. Um, um, but one of the things I started to realize, and then I moved on to the state office. Um, so um, working for the state WIC office where I was in a training and field services um, unit. So you can see I had a really straight line up to that point um, with just a few years into my career. We're working at a state WIC office, um, again, very integrated. I worked for the North Carolina Get Folic campaign. Um, I was really lucky in this, and this is where I learned the power of public, academic, and nonprofit partnerships. Um, North Carolina at the time had the high, the world's, among the world's highest rates of preventable neural tube, uh, neural tube defects. Um, um, these are things like spina, spina bifida, best known. And we came together in a collaboration to help solve that public health problem. Um, so that was really, um, um, uh, really an important time and a really important that I think that um, it just really continues to show us the power of collaboration when we have public health or clinical problems, how we all need to want to coordinate and come together on them. So I, um, um, and then from there, um, I really learned a lot, you all. I think the great thing about being a dietitian is we don't just learn nutrition and have clinical skills or knowledge. We learn bigger life skills and the skill I developed is that I turned out to be really good at is I'm really good at data and evaluation and I became to really love that work and love this collaboration work. And so I left for a few I left for seven years and I worked for the National Center for Child Traumatic Stress where I was an improvement advisor and I worked as an evaluator. Um, and um, so for those of this, uh, I, I really want to just mention this because um, I think when we think about building up dietitians, we can be lots of places. We have lots of transferable skills. Um, and then I made my way back to what I'm doing now, which is some clinical work and, and also working with um, uh, uh, the clinical work that I'm telling you now, I, I wrapped back around to that, kind of bringing on from my earlier time. Um, and, and then I have started these new businesses. I, I want to get back to what Andrew talked about, which is this big question. I um, mean, this came up a lot, I have to say, uh, in 2020, when internships were really hard to come by, which is, how do you get training as a pediatric dietitian? And let's be honest, it's a little tough. Um, there are a few fellowships that are out there. There's some NICU-oriented um, one. There's some eating disorders ones and diabetes-related ones. Um, but it's a pretty tough thing to do, and I think it's also um, a little bit hard because of um, um, much of the continuing education that's out there is adult-focused. And you know, my time working outside of nutrition, um, I, we were working in raising the standard of care. How do you bring evidence-based care into become everyday care? 
The really important thing I think we all know is that going to a lecture is insufficient. Even if, it, how do you take that care and make it everyday care it takes authentic practice. It takes doing it, it takes having a case, it takes being part of it. And I think that's a real gap. And that's one I'm actually really trying to, to, to help um, solve for folks who maybe want to get into pediatrics or maybe are doing adults and have to cover pediatrics. And part of what on my, on my um, nutrition hub, I'm, I'm putting together um, um, some upskills groups. Um, you can you look over on my um, that website for that. Um, and that these are really collaborative mentoring and skills groups that really can give you the, the everyday skills that you need to do. So you could really jump in and go ahead and do a job to help you guide you along that. What should we be reading? Where should you um, within certain topics? Um, so I think that's really important. And I don't know if maybe there's somebody else out there, if they found something really useful um, for working in pediatrics um, of, um, uh, of how they're getting their care. I'd love to hear from you about that, too. Um, so keep your questions coming. I see a question. Let's see. A couple questions came in while I was talking. Um, let's see. Ah, so I see um, Kylie just asked a great question um, is about how are we getting amino acid formulas for your patients um, that suppliers are out and can't get anymore and that, um, um, yeah, I mean, it, Kylie, um, I think that um, you work for an infusion and a DME company just as contacts for some of our other folks who are out there. Um, to help know how that works. And I'm guessing this works the same way for you. In North Carolina, our Medicaid pro program that I, I work at a, I, I work in an environment um, on my everyday clinical work where I'm serving about 90% of my patients are Medicaid. Um, North Carolina Medicaid will pay for these specialized formulas, which is amazing. There's only 11 states that requires insurance to pay for specialized formulas like this. Um, that's a huge issue. We need corrected in the, this country, um, um, too. But, um, but um, what happens is I will go through these DME or infusion companies to get them. But they, they actually don't have their warehouses, or they'll have small warehouses, and they're actually going through these big regional warehouses, mostly a company called Cardinal and another one called McKesson. And if Cardinal and McKesson are out of particular formulas, the DME can't get them. But here's the other problem that's going on is that the, all the DMEs are using the same warehouses. So Kylie, I wish I had a better answer for you. I, one thing you made me miss that I was talking about earlier is I've had a few situations where I'm having patients where I, I've called my DME, they have the formula, I send the order, and then the DME is out of it by the afternoon. Um, so this has been a really very difficult um, situation. Um, some of what we've been trying to do is I'm using some, um, um, early on we were able to get some help directly from some of the less used and newer brands, like what's out there from Canberra with Equicare and Essential Care Junior. Um, um, some of our DMEs, we were really lucky, had small amounts. Um, the other thing we've started to realize, um, and thank goodness for our hospital, who's just been amazing, our inpatient pediatric di um, manager has just been fabulous. And hospitals are getting a little bit more access, and so we're sometimes bridging literally out of the hospital stock because we can get it delivered and a DME can't. So those have been some of the strategies that we're, we're having to do. I don't know if other folks have some other things that they really um, uh, want to talk about with that, but it's it's really hard. And the other thing I'm really taking a good hard look at, y'all, is any child who's on an amino acid formula. I'm really looking if we have to turn if we can turn them over to something that's not amino acid. Can for those in, there's peptide formulas. Can I move them over to that? In one instance, I had a. a Honestly, we had a 10-year-old that we put back on Nutramagen um, for a little bit because I could get Nutramagen um, ready to feed for a little bit until I could find an amino acid powder. Um, so if you know pediatric dietitians, please check on us. Um, <laughs> we are tired. We are stressed. We are worried. Um, 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 because um, we are really being faced in some cases for something unprecedented, certainly within my career, which is 
we simply won't, don't have access to formulas that are our everyday ways of helping um, children grow and to thrive. So I want to be mindful. I'm sorry I got on a few minutes late. I really want to be mindful of the time here, too. So how about we get a last few questions? I see Leah. Thank you so much. Leah mentioned a little bit about my website, which is about Formula Sense. Um, I want to mention to you all, just as a parting word, um, I have something a little special for all of you today. One of the questions about getting more formula is I actually, in Formula Sense, have this formula at a glance handout. It has all six, um, all 64 formulas, kind of tells you what's what has intact formula um, proteins, what's hydrolyzed, what's partial, what's amino acid, all of that. Um, I kind of created it recently because I was getting so many questions about what can I use in place. It's actually for sale on my website, but I've actually given 50% um, off for all of you, anybody who watches it from Build Up. So if you go on to Formula Sense, you'll see it there as the at a glance and you want to check out. If you just write Build Up in the next week, you'll actually be able to download it and buy it for free. For I'm sorry, for 50% off, only five bucks if you want to have it. The best thing about it is this is a this is an ongoing resource, so you don't have to ever pay for it again. Anytime there's an update to it, you'll just get sent a new one and you'll be all set. Um, so with that, I, I appreciate being here with you all today. Um, don't hesitate to be in touch with me through um, um, through Facebook. Um, Join our, if you're pediatrics, join our pediatric page here at Build Up 2. Um, and thanks so much to everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.